Greetings everyone, Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Ranking the Albums. It's Sunday. Thanks for spending some time with us here today. Today we're going to take a look at a uh, cool little three album discography from a guy that everybody knows and everybody loves, Joe Perry and the Joe Perry Project. Of course, Joe left Aerosmith back in the late, very late 70s. Right around 1979, as a matter of fact, after the Night in the Ruts album, there was already issues going on there, right? Him and Steven Tyler weren't getting along. There was drug problems running rampant throughout the band, right? Good time to jump ship and start up and do your own thing, right? That's exactly what Joe did. Started up the Joe Perry Project. Did that for about three and a half or so years, right? And then, of course, went back to Aerosmith. They kissed and made up. Everything was all fine. So they leave behind three studio albums. I'm going to rank them in my order of preference as I like them. I have hard copies of two of the three. For some reason, I always thought I had the other one and realized I never actually bought the physical copy of it, at least not on CD anyway. Uh, so I just I rectified that. I ordered it. It hasn't come in quite in time for me to actually show it off, but uh, oh well. We'll do the best we can without it, right? So let's, uh, without further ado, let's start off with my number three. With number three, I'm going to start off with their second album from 1981. I've got the Rock and Rolls again. Pretty cool album cover, right? Joe looks badass as always. And uh, he's got the guitar case sitting there. He's got his jacket slung over his shoulder. All right, there's the guys in the back of the band. Produced by Bruce Botnick. Made it to number 100 on the Billboard charts here in the States. You got a guy named Charlie Farron in on lead vocals and rhythm guitar for this album. That's the one thing about the Joe Perry Project albums. All three of them had different lineups. You know, you had the rhythm section on two of the three that were the same, but then and the third album, completely different lineup. So not a lot of consistency there, which I think maybe hurt them in, in the long run. Uh, you got, uh, so Charlie Farron, lead vocals and rhythm guitar. You got uh, Joe Perry, obviously, on all sorts of guitars and vocals and on bass and drums you've got hold on i'll tell you in a second basically the same as on the first album you've got uh, david hall on bass and ronnie stewart on drums so the rhythm section stayed the same for the first two albums uh, like i said bruce botnick producing this particular one joe sings uh lead vocals on two songs so it starts off with a song called uh, east coast west coast fun song Kind of sounds more like a harder rocking the babies though, but it's still pretty cool, pretty catchy song. Not bad. It just doesn't it doesn't quite fit, I think, uh, what the Joe Perry Project would or should sound like. But it's not a bad song at all. Uh, you got uh, no substitute for arrogance, which is kind of back to basics, raunchy, bluesy, hard rock, more in line with what they were doing on the first album. And uh, I think Charlie Farron showing he's not a bad singer but i don't think he has a lot of range like if you listen to this album and you're thinking yeah he's okay it's not great though um title track is really good i've got the rock and rolls again i really like that that's a good bluesy hard rock gem great riffing great soloing from joe really like that one a lot uh buzz buzz yeah that sucks that's not good uh silly generic boogie don't like that at all Soldier of Fortune, that's not really good either. Don't really dig that as well. Uh, chorus is terrible. Joe singing lead vocals, he's not a good singer, as we'll talk about in a bit. But um, yeah, don't really like those two songs at all. Then you got a song called TV Police. Uh, that's pretty heavy. Big fat grooves on it. Joe using the talk box, which we hear him do throughout uh, Aerosmith's career, right? It's always kind of cool when Joe, wham, 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 type of thing. That's pretty neat. Uh, Listen to the Rock. That's got some kind of early Aerosmith groove to it. Got a little bit of swagger. I like that one. It's not bad. Uh, Dirty Little Things. Yeah, generic, unmemorable. Not a fan of that. Uh, you got the moody play the game. It's got them. Got some cool guitar moments for Joe. I think uh, Mr. Farron there is trying to do his best. Uh, Steven Tyler. I don't mind that one too much. And then you got the closer, South Station Blues, which, uh, you know, I think sees Joe trying to do uh, like a uh, early Fleetwood Mac, Peter Green era Fleetwood Mac type of uh, blues rock thing. It's a pretty good bluesy rave up, I think, but he sings on this one too. His vocals are just weak. I mean, there's just no other way around it. So overall, a couple pretty good songs. 
couple really crappy songs, and I don't really like the production all that much. I think the production is very mid-rangey. Uh, the vocals for me also are hit or miss. You know, Charlie Farron, he's okay. He's not great, and Joe is just not good no matter what way you look at it. But the guitar work is stellar as always. Um, I just think uh, maybe compared to the debut, this is pretty mediocre. Uh, you know, that had a lot of promise, then this comes out, and it's just kind of like, eh, what happened here? But it's, it's not awful. It's not really all that good either. But like I said, a couple really good songs. The rest, eh. All right, coming in number two. Obviously, I'm going to go with, uh, let me pull it up on my phone here so you can see the cover for those of you who don't know. I'm going to go with uh, Once a Rocker, Always a Rocker. All right. Joe looking kind of badass there on the cover, right? This is the third album from 1983. Completely different band here this time around. Why not, right? So we got uh, Joe on guitars and a little bit of bass. You got uh, this guy named Cowboy Mock Bell on vocals. What the hell kind of name is that? Don't know. Have we ever heard of this guy ever since? Probably not. Uh, Danny Hargrove on bass. Uh, Joe Pett on drums. Um, you got, uh, oh boy. I didn't write his last name down. Harry something or other on piano, and he also co-produces alongside Joe. Forgive me, guys. I uh, didn't write down his last name. But, uh, yeah, you can tell by listening to this album that they were going for a little bit more balls uh, on the production end. This album sounds a little raunchier, a little crunchier, especially from the guitar perspective, which I thought that second album was just kind of lacking something uh, from the production standpoint. But... Uh, also, I want to mention uh, Jim Biggins and Rich, Rick Cunningham uh, both contribute some sax to this album as well. Uh, the op opening title track is a crunchy hard rocker. Really like that one a lot. You got Black Velvet Pants. Kind of brings to mind the Stones, like maybe, uh, I don't know, mid-late 70s Stones, right? A little more, little more balls on the guitar. Uh, the production sounds like the Stones even has like the honky-tonk piano. That's not bad. Uh, Women in Chains to me, isn't all that different from, like, similar period Alice Cooper. And uh, Mr. Bell sounds a little bit like Al, uh, Alice on the, on the vocals, which is kind of interesting. Then you got a song called Four Guns West, groove-laden heavy rocker. Really like his guitar tone on that one. It's nice and nasty. Might be my favorite song on the album. That's really good. It's called Four Guns West. Uh, you got a song called Crossfire, which has some really good drumming and grooves to it. Some nice slashing guitar licks from Joe. That's pretty good as well. Uh, you got the funky Adriana. Okay, another excuse for Joe to kind of unleash some kind of cool chicken scratch. Right, guitar scratch. Really like that one a lot. Uh, Kings of the Kings, muscular hard rock. Although by this time in the album, you know, I, I kind of finally realized like what I wasn't really digging about uh, Cowboy Mock Bell uh, on the vocals throughout this album. And I really, once we got to King, King of the Kings, he's starting to sound too close to Vince Neil for my comfort level. Uh, and I'm like, kind of like, yeah, not really, I'm not a big fan of Vince Neil. So right? but at that point, I'm kind of like, yeah, song would be good. Not really digging his vocals too much on there. Uh, then you have a, a pretty heavy but kind of safe take on T-Rex's Bang a Gong, right? So you got a, a cover song there. Uh, Walk Me With Me Sally is kind of generic blues rock, but you got some really blistering guitar solos and things from Joe, so that's always a good thing. Uh, Never Want to Stop, another kind of funky blues rock song. Got some really neat slide licks from uh, Joe on that one. Again, it's kind of a hit or miss album. Uh, and I'm not really sure I like Bell as a singer, but I think the production is better. I think this album rocks a little bit more than the one before it, and I, I think Joe's guitar tone is pretty killer throughout the whole album. So, And the album rocks quite a bit, so I don't mind it, whereas I think the, the second album is just not very good. This one isn't very good either, but it's a little bit better uh, in my, for me. But number one, easily, I mean, it's not even close, guys, is Let the Music Do the Talking from 1980. Yeah, I mean, this this is a really good album. So, you know, like I said, he leaves Aerosmith after Night in the Ruts. It's the most successful of the three albums, by the way. This uh, actually sold about a quarter of a million copies, like 250,000 copies. Pretty significant, right? Um, and he brought along Jack Douglas to produce the album. He had worked with Jack with Aerosmith, of course. He's got a guy named Ralph Mormon on vocals on most of the album. Uh, Joe plays guitar and sings 
David Hull on bass, Ronnie Stewart on drums. You know, none of which are, are, are big names here, but the results are quite good. And, uh, you know, the opening title track, Let the Music Do the Talking, is a complete crusher. Um, a great song. One, you know, you could say the best Aerosmith solo song, you know, from a member solo project uh, song from any member, easily. Not that most of the guys in the band did lots of solo albums, right? But uh, I think stacking up next to, like, you know, Whitford St. Holmes or anything that Steven Tyler ever did, I would say Let the Music Do the Talking is probably the greatest song from someone in Aerosmith outside of Aerosmith. So much so that they even went and did it on an Aerosmith album. Just absolutely great song. Absolutely great. Uh, from there, you got Conflict of Interest. Raunchy, slightly funky. Um, Joe's singing this one. He's not much of a singer. He kind of sounds a little bit like Ace Frehley here. Kind of weak. Doesn't have really much of any range. You know, uh, Discount Dogs. Bumps and grinds like classic Aerosmith's got a little touch of early Pat Travers on there as well another really good song killer vocal from uh, Mormon he's actually a pretty damn good singer um, it's just a shame that uh, they didn't use him for all the albums or this entire album for that matter um, Shooting Star another kick-ass hard rocker with some slashing guitars his vocals still aren't great a little bit better results on this particular one, but he's just he's just not a good singer. And it's a really good song, so it's a shame that the, the vocals are actually so weak. Um, break song, molten, hot, instrumental, deserved to be longer. It's only about two minutes long. Some kick-ass guitar soloing from Joe on that. Just a really, really cool song. Again, I wish it was like four or five minutes long. Uh, you got the funky rock and train, another groovy mover. Really like that one a lot. You got the heavy blues rocker, The Mist is Rising is cool, but man, what's not cool is Joe's vocals. Ugh, just not good. Weak, weak, weak. And again, really good song. What are you going to do? Ready on the Firing Line sounds like vintage The Faces or Humble Pie. It's got that kind of raw, early, mid 70s heavy blues rock thing going on. It definitely sounds like something from a different era awesome song you got the raucous life at a glance is like prime aerosmith love it love the raunchy grooves uh, i think overall this is a really strong album would have been even better if joe let ralph sing the entire album because i think joe i mean let yeah i think ralph's vocals are really well done on the album he just really fits this style of music and joe's vocals just don't fit at all sadly uh, love Joe Perry, but yeah, I just wish he left all the singing up to uh, to Ralph Mormon. But otherwise, the songs are really good on this album. That's that's kind of what crazy, you know, the the strength of the material here is really high, and it's a, it just seems to me like the two albums that came afterwards, they were just kind of searching for songs. Uh, again, there are some good songs on those albums. I think if you take all the best of the of the other two albums and put them together, you have one pretty good album. Uh, otherwise, you have two mediocre albums for the most part, which is a, is a sad thing. You know, I know Joe was struggling to kind of get this band to be heard. You know, they uh, they were opening up for some bigger bands and they were playing tiny clubs and not selling many records. And it's kind of a shame because uh, I think Joe had the uh, capability to do some really good things. And plus, he was you know not in the best place himself uh, from a physical standpoint, right? during this time period but whatever regardless out of the three you got one really really good one like i said you can make a really good compilation of the other two that makes a pretty decent album but i think the lack of like consistency in the lineup and the vocalist that didn't help at all so uh but yeah so this is my number one let the music do the talking we're gonna go with uh, i've got the rock and rolls again uh in at number three and number two is going to be once a rocker always a rocker so only three albums let us know Holy dogs barking. Let us know what you think uh, of and how you would rank these albums in the comments below. And visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. All together, all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave. We also have the link below to our Ko-Fi page as well as our merch page. And that's down in the uh, video description. So go check those out. And I thank you in advance for all of that. And uh, tune in again next week 
Sunday, we'll have another Ranking the Albums episode. This time it'll be the great Swedish retro rock band. They're, they play psych, they play classic hard rock, they do a little folky stuff, they do a mix of everything. They're just a really great late 60s, early 70s inspired band. Sienna Root, they've got a whole bunch of albums to their credit. I'll be ranking those next week, so stay tuned for that. And a lot more here on the channel. Of course, tomorrow we've got uh, the Hudson Valley Squares, so stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll see you real soon here on CD Tranquility. I'm Pete Pardo. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.